faint. And I will okay. be recording the meeting as you just heard. Okay. All right. Um, so let's make this official. Um, if uh, we could, uh, this is the um, August 14th meeting of the Gaming Policy Advisory Committee Addiction Services Subcommittee, um, officially calling it to order. Uh, why don't we do a roll call of members? Um, Rudy Vega, Rodolfo Vega. Present. Present. Marlene Warner. Here. And Victor Ortiz. Present. Okay. Um, and this is Mark Vanderland, and I'm present. Um, there is a fifth member of the committee um, or a seat that is open, and that seat is appointed by the, the governor's office. So um, we don't have a full committee, but we do have a quorum um, present today. Um, okay, so why don't we move on to item number two, um, approval of the minutes. So we have two two sets of minutes here. We have the August twenty second minutes, and um, Long Ban was was uh, was were Long. Did you do these minutes for us? Okay, and I think that you observed in the recording that there there was a move to accept the minutes, but it wasn't seconded. Seconded, so we're bringing it back to the committee um, for a. Uh, a motion to approve in a second so that it's that, that it's official. Is that correct? Okay, fantastic. All right. So you have the August 22nd minutes in your packet. Um, hopefully you've had a chance to review. Could I get a motion to accept those minutes or any revisions to those minutes? So move. This is Marlene. Okay. Can I get a second? A second. Okay, fantastic. Um, all right. I, uh, um, Rudy Vega, do you approve the minutes? I, I abstain because I wasn't present. Oh, you weren't there. Okay. All right. So um, we have a motion. We have a second. Marlene, approve. I approve. Yeah. Okay, Victor, approve. And I approve as well. All right. So I think we are set now for those August twenty second meeting minutes. Um, we can move on to the November 3rd meeting minutes. Um, and Grace, I'm, um, we only have two members that exactly. um, were at that meeting. Yo-Yo is no longer a member of the committee. I don't know whether, because we don't have a, a quorum or we don't have, we, I'm not sure how we proceed with those minutes. Do you have a sense of that? Yes, um, if that's the case, um, they will just need to remain in draft form. Um, there would be no mechanism to vote to approve them at this time. So um, we will just keep them in draft form. If anyone has any changes, we can make those changes. Um, and I believe we can still upload them. They would just won't be formally approved minutes. They'll just be drafts. Okay. Um, but in the meantime, um, I, I reviewed them and Marlene do you have any edits to those minutes? I don't. Okay. So I guess for the record, while we can't officially approve those and they remain in draft form, the two of the three members that were at that meeting approved those minutes. Okay. All right. Anything further for item number two in the minutes? All right, let's move on to item number three. Actually, actually, I, I lied about that. Can I just ask a question? Because Rudy, do you remember, did you join that meeting later? Because we have you um, calling the motion to conclude the meeting. So did Rudy just not join? And so let me, let me, let me go, let me check something. Let me go, let, let me go back. Okay. Do you That's see what I'm saying, Mark? I yeah, I stand corrected. I did not attend the November third meeting. I did attend. I did attend the August twenty second meeting. Yes, I did attend. I did attend that one. 
That's okay. fine. So, so what I'm saying is the minutes in conclusion say that Chair Vanderlyn called for a motion to adjourn and Mr. Vega so moved and Ms. Mm. Yao seconded it. So, so someone's minutes are off or someone's recording is off. No, 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 Marlene, no, Marlene, it's not off. Yeah. It was my mistake. I say that I was absent yeah. for the August 22nd meeting. No, but I was at that meeting. No, no, I was that. not present at the November meeting. Right. Sorry. It's the November that's meeting I'm talking about. Sorry, can I just... We're talking Sorry. about the November meeting. That's correct. So it, it is an, an update. I will make that update. Thank you, Marlene. Um, so what happened was I used that um, the, the minute from the August. So that needs to ah. be taken off. So I will strike that out and we'll, we'll, we'll update that. Do we okay. know who concluded? I mean, it doesn't really. We we have a recording of it, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, perfect. Okay. And make that edit to it. Perfect. Okay. okay. So why don't uh, um why don't we put this back on the agenda for the next meeting, and then we can, while it would still okay. remain in draft, we can just make sure that that correction is taken care of. Great. Okay. Right. Okay. Let's move on to item number three, um, court exclusion process and support, court exclusion process support and update. And so um, just to set the stage a little bit, um, as you all know, this was a, sort of an issue that this committee um, has been paying attention to and tracking um, for quite some time now. Um, the court exclusion um, process is a reference to a statutory requirement that um, that a family member can initiate an exclusion process through the district court um, and that uh, the gaming commission upon courts the court order would place um, an individual on the exclusion list um, the court would have a process in place to do a problem gambling assessment. Um, and um, in order to make that determination of whether or not the individual um, is a problem gambler and whether it would meet a criteria to be placed on, on the exclusion list. Um, that regulation is in place under, I think, two, is it? Sorry, 257, CMR 257, the exclusion process. Um, and we've been working through this committee, but also specifically with um, Victor Ortiz and his team at the Department of Public Health. Um, there is some challenges to this, and I was wondering, Victor, if you could kind of, uh, kind of help out in articulating kind of where things are and what, what hurdles are in place and if there's any assistance that this group could be um let's talk about that yeah thank you mark and um so so first of all um thanks to really the gaming commission to mark and uh commissioner skinner for reaching out to dph and um you know really trying to set forth a uh a collaborative effort around this particular effort of the third party self exclusion and we obviously have been meeting extensively to try to um, get this from a conceptual perspective to an actual um, implementation of an, an initiative. And as all things, when you start to open it up, it, it, there's a lot of questions. <laughs> right? We have more questions than answer at this moment in time. But I, I think there's, a, um, there's definitely a, a, um, a commitment and a, and, a, and, a, and a shared value that we want to try to provide as many tools in the toolbox for family members in regards to uh, really addressing um, issues related to problem gambling. Currently, right now, we've identified four sort of different work streams. Um, and this is not just us uh, between DPH and the Gaming Commission who have met extensively, uh, but also we've had some conversations with um, um, individuals from the courts who also have shared their perspective and what's needed in order to get it from a concept to an actual implementation. So I'm just going to kind of go over those four work streams and kind of provide a little bit of an update on some of those areas. So the four updates, are, I mean, the four work streams are one is training. Um, we have heard um, 
from the courts themselves that there needs to be an extensive level of training uh, for the court personnel, including judges, uh, in order to build their capacity and understanding in regards to problem gambling. Uh, so there's a, a training component that needs to be um, that needs to be organized and coordinated. Uh, the second work stream is a, is a structure for reimbursement. Um, so as the court personnel, which are the folks who are identified as psychologists who are under the courts would need um, a mechanism for reimbursements when they conduct the assessments. Um, so we have a couple of areas that we're trying to figure out a mechanism for that reimbursement to occur. Obviously it's very uh, complicated. There's some legal elements associated with it. Um, but you know, the one thing for sure that in this sort of preliminary phase of this particular uh, that we're currently at, um, we have committed from, from, our, from our funding here at the Office of Problem Gambling Services to help support that initial stage and then sort of assess it as it goes along um, and, and, and provide that funding uh, for that initial stage. And we'll make future determinations as we go along, but just to kind of get it again from concept to implementation. Um, there is a, um, a third third lane, a third sort of work stream, which is the coordination of service. We've been told by the courts that there is um, a need to make sure that we have a mechanism that when there is a, a, a loved one petitions the court, that there needs to be someone who then sort of can coordinate that service um, for that to happen. So if somebody requests um, a loved one that wanted, you know, uh, exclude from, uh, to put them on, on VSC, there needs to be uh, outside the court system, uh, a coordination to coordinate the, uh, the, the, the assessment, whether it's conducted by psychologists, uh, that needs to be coordinated so that, that we have to figure that out. And then the, the, the last work stream is the development of resources. Uh, something that's important to us is to ensure that as family members uh, come before the courts, we want to make sure that they have uh, an abundance of resources that, uh, you know, for um, support for themselves or in, uh, any members of their family. So these are the four areas that we are sort of identify as the key work streams to get it from both from a concept to, to implementation. Um, needless to say, it's, it's complicated because it involves uh, many areas um, of legalities and things of that nature. And, um, and so, but we are working through that. And I think we're heading in the right direction in the context of getting it implemented. Um, and um, so that's currently where we're at at this stage. Um, Victor, I, I would like to point out, you you have assigned a project or a project manager to this. And I think that that is a really good move um, as you've outlined some of the complexities of this process. So um, just a credit to you and the team to uh, take that step and try to coordinate this this rollout. Well, we we appreciate it, Mark. And you know, I think it's um, needless to say. Um, there's, I think anything. I think all of us have experienced that when we have a concept, right? It's it looks well on a concept. It's really the the details, right, that are important. And um, we're happy to to assign uh, one of our project managers with this particular uh, project mm -hmm. because there's just so much entities and moving parts of this. And uh, we, we intend to continue to work through these work streams, um, but also update this committee and or our partners in this space. Um, is there, a, you and I have spoken a little bit offline on this in terms of kind of where the gaming commission is in terms of what support we can and um, I, haven't been much help. I I wish we could be <laughs> more help. Um, honestly, um, but if there if there are any sticking points here that you feel like um, you want to raise with this group that you think could be helpful, um, please feel free to, to let us know. No, I, I I appreciate that, Mark. And I think that at this stage, um, it was I think it's an accomplishment for us just to identify the work streams, right? Um, and I think that in some areas, some are better than others. For example, in the training component, um, that to us is an easy sort of lift because we have an existing contract through our technical assistance center 
and they already been aware in regards to that this is coming down the pike in regards to them to outline the training component. And obviously we'll talk about what that looks like, things of that nature. So on the training front, that's that's kind of an easy lift for us to, to, to facilitate that. But I think the challenging part is the, the structure of reimbursement is where we have a sticking point here, but we do have two, um, two options that are viable at this moment in time um, that we're pursuing. Uh, but the good thing is that we are providing, oops, sorry, my lights here. Um, we do intend to leverage our um, resources, financial resources to help support this initial stage um, is just really figuring out the structure of the reimbursement um, and which is the best path. So hopefully we'll have an, um, we'll make more progress in that, in that space. And then I think the development of resources is an easy lift because it allows, I mean, we have an abundance of resources that um, that we have currently right now. We might have to obviously identify others, but I think that's that's something that is controllable by all of us, uh, all of our partners. And then the, the, the last sticking point is the coordination of service, which we have to figure out. But I, I think the fact that we've been able to identify the work streams and work through them, I think is an accomplishment to itself. Victor, do you have a, a goal as to like, once these work streams are further along, like when you hope to be able to publicly release, you know, promote this and and kind of get this live? Have a go I, live? I, 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 it's a great question, Marlene. I think that what I would love, what I recommend is that number one, when we are further along in the work streams, um, that we have a conversation either here or in other spaces to figure out a, a coordinated effort because it's going to involve various entities, right? I mean, it's, it's you know, obviously we're being supportive in this space, right? Um, in the context of leveraging our resources to participate in this, but it, it this, this, this is really a collaborative effort, right? There's a role here for the gaming commission. There's obviously a role here for the game sense advisors and things of that nature, because they need to be aware because they're the front lines in the context. And so that, that has to be coordinated with the game sense advisors. There's no other, you know, we have to be able to do that because they have to be aware. And I, I, I recommend that at some point in this process, um, as we get further along before we even go live, we should have a debriefing with the game sense advisors to, to ask them what they, how they feel about it or whatever, because it's to get their feedback because sure. that hasn't happened. I mean, they're the front lines. They're in the casinos. They're working with folks. We haven't had that. I would, I was, I would venture out to say that we should have that opportunity um, to engage them. Um, I want to make sure that all the I's and dotted and T's are crossed before yeah. it's identified as a resource. Great. Well, and one of the um, items, one of the topics that we discover or explored on this is how our casino operators engaging with talking with family members who are coming forward and saying, I have a loved one who is in the throes of a gambling addiction um, and I don't know what to do. And uh, making sure that they know what resources are available, including including this. And so GameSense is GameSense helpline, these sort of frontline um, resources, but I, I really, these casino operators, um, um, each have a response when I ask them what they what they do, um, but I think that this is an important piece of it as well. So I want to add them to it. Yeah, no, definitely. I I totally agree. I I I would say that I'm sure that we probably have, well we definitely have more questions and answers at this moment in time, and I'm sure that through other engagements there will be more questions that maybe we didn't think about. Uh, and I, I would strongly recommend just from my experience that we try to address as many of those questions before going sort of, you know, uh, going public with the, with the actual initiative to make sure that we've we crossed all our T's and dotted all our I's. Uh, but Marlene, getting back to your point, um, yeah, we're going to have to do some some coordination of engagement with uh, the GameSense folks and other folks in, in your shop uh, and other folks, other stakeholders to um, make sure that we're on the right path or maybe if we're missing something or whatever the case may be. And again, 
we're happy to help as the department and in, in, in the spirit of collaboration. Um, this is not, although um, you know, this is not in the, in our mainstream of work, but in, in in light of the fact that we share this the same commitment, um, I think it's a it's a, an important initiative to to uh, to work together on. Yeah, great. I, we're we're ready. So you let us know. I I think the four workflows makes perfect sense. I appreciate you guys lining those up and thinking so much and so so strategically about them. So let us know when you're at that spot. We're happy to help or or with anything else as you as you move through this. We're absolutely a very willing and interested partner um, as you move forward. And I guess the question for me, Mark, if I may ask, is is these are the four work streams that we identified through the multiple conversations that we've had either with um, with the gaming commission and or the courts. But maybe the question I could ask here is, is there a work stream that we're missing <laughs> that mm -hmm. we didn't identify? Um, maybe that's a, if, if you think of it, if Rudy or Marlene, if you think that there's a work stream that we're missing, happy to add it to it um, if, if you feel that. Okay, okay, let me think about it. I, I think you articulated them very well, but certainly if Rudy and Marlene have more to add, that would be great. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, to your point earlier, Victor, like, Victor, I also you, think... Victor, could you please... No, I'm sorry, Marlene, I'm sorry, Rick, Rick, Marlene is speaking, hold on a second, I'm sorry. <clears throat> I was just going to say that um, maybe we can... I assume this is what you're thinking anyway, but that you would test pilot it in one of the courts and just see how it goes, right? Like, and 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 see if, I, you know, I could think all day and all night about this and I might miss something pretty obvious because we haven't put it into place. Um, so I guess that would be one piece. And then to me, one of the other things I'm interested in is just what is, and Mark, we haven't really talked about this in a while, but like, what are we doing a little bit more upstream? I think we all agreed that, like everything Victor laid out is exactly right, but that's like the end of the road. And we want to have the casinos doing some work and the sports betting operators doing some work. And, and frankly, now that we have iLottery, everyone doing their, their things ahead of the, ahead of it getting to a court system. So um, I just want to figure out what are we doing a little bit more upstream? Um, and that's not on DPH. I think that's on all the regulatory bodies. Yeah, Marlene, I um, I like I like both of those scenarios, um, and I agree with you. So I appreciate that. So my my question is this, um, to your point, Mark, in regards to the test pilot, um, is it my understanding that now that the regulation has been changed by the Gaming Commission in regards to the VSE and adding the third party self exclusion, is that now accessible by all courts? Right, because once you go into implementation, so I, I think that I, I agree with uh, you, Marlene. That, real quick, it's available in, in um, district courts, and a uh, point of clarification to that is that it's part of the exclusion regulation, not the voluntary self. -exclusion. Okay, okay, thank you, Mark, for district court. Okay, and then um, I, Marlene, to add to your point, if I may, around the upstream approaches, I think it would be really helpful, Mark, and something that the gaming commission um, could potentially do is maybe lay out some kind of a grid about what that upstream approach is. Like, you know, so it's really mapping that out for folks, right? Like, so we say, okay, this is this is one option, but here are all the different recommended or suggested strategies that folks should consider prior to, to this. So it's just like laying out a map and, and, and might be something that the gaming commission might want to consider. As it relates to those upstream approaches. Yeah, uh, we could certainly help with that. Um, I I think that the gaming commission has a piece of that, but um, I'm not. I'm definitely not trying to pass the buck. But I think it's it is really it's DPH and the gaming commission and yes. making sure that those services are available. And um, we we did a while ago try to start pulling together sort of a what framework of what different options would be. You know, and there's all these different domains. There's, you know, legal, there's financial, there's um, clinical or therapeutic. There's, you know, there's, there are different ways in which 
practically speaking, people are encountering a range of different significant issues related to their loved ones gambling. And and um, absolutely, we said we've said from the beginning of this committee that we need to focus on that that upstream to make sure that there is more than just this. And because this is going to be low utilization, and this should be the la the the bot sort of end of the line. Yeah, and I think what you're referencing, Mark, are resources, which resources, they might be the same resources prior to someone going to a court and even after the court. I guess what I'm referencing is the concept of us making sure we're working with the, all the licensees, make sure that they have a sound policy and program related to a family member reaching out. And I know you went and talked okay. to licensees. Mm -hmm or at least the casinos. I don't know if you spoke to all the sports betting operators, mm -hmm. but like putting something to a little bit more formal together to talk to them about what is like either, what are they doing um, on their own voluntarily or what is the gaming commission guiding them on in terms of how they would handle a patron's um, family, member, family member affected other and how do they then reach that patron? How is game sense of all? Like that's the conversation as far as I know, we haven't had yet. And I was hoping that we would have that conversation. I mean, it's fine. The last, you know, the end of the road is happening first, but we just don't want to forget about this other piece. Cause I think that piece is going to be much more utilized than this piece. But I think this piece still has to exist because there are still family members who are pretty desperate. So. Uh, Marlene, can I ask a question? Um, well, let me ask make a comment and then a question for Mark. So I'm gonna place the upstream approach and add it as a sub bullet on the development of re resource work stream, just to kind of stick it in there um, and try to flush that out. And also the test pilot under the coordination of service. So we'll add that as a sub bullet under that. So we'll, we'll, we'll put those as sub bullets under our work streams. But Mark, I'm wondering to, to your point, Marlene, I, I agree with you. I wonder Mark, if it's worth exploring that all of the online uh, licensees have to submit an annual RG plan. And I'm wondering mm -hmm. if this is something that should fit under their annual mm -hmm. RG plan as to developing that type of uh, um, sort of up yeah. approaches to family members as part of a directive from the Gaming Commission as that should be included in their plan. I, I think that's a really, um, that's a, that's a great recommendation um, that all MGC licensees have a plan to respond to family members who are expressing concern about a loved one with a gambling problem. Yeah. Okay. Long, <laughs> take note of that. <laughs> Rudy, you were going to say something oh, just sorry. a little bit ago. I don't want to, I don't want to lose that. I lost track uh, of Victor's third point. Uh, Victor, you mentioned four pillars uh, of uh, training, structural reimbursement, <coughs> resource for services. What was the third one? Coordination of services. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. And then we're adding the... Um as sub bullets to the development of resources with, with developing um, upstream approaches and then a sub bullet under coordination of services test pilot. Can we talk about the test pilot a second? I, we, we have some time to kind of really chew on this stuff. What, what <laughs> would a test pilot look like in uh, your mind? I'll give it to Marlene since it was her idea, but I agree with it. But... <laughs> <laughs> So, I mean, in my mind, it's it's that instead of training everyone and putting this in place for everyone, you're just going to do it in one court system. You're going to work with one specific team of people and assess like maybe our training's missing something or maybe the coordination of, of services in um, outside of the court system is lacking something. Um, we just want to like test it before we like implement it everywhere. And then we realize we've missed something and then we have to implement that change everywhere. Um, so, you know, we go into whatever Lowell district court and in Lowell, we um, 
implement all of this as is um, or wherever, it doesn't matter. But, um, and then we, I think we designate a certain amount of time and we have a bit of an assessment planned pre-implementation and then we're going to just assess how it's going. That's to me how we would test pilot it and then we would roll it, plan to roll it out either across the rest of the system or court by court. Um, that's what I'm thinking about. Yeah, yeah, I, I um, let me say, I, I agree, number one, Marlene, because I think I think one of the things that we're learning is that as we're sort of diving into this with the Gaming Commission, more questions are arising, right? Like, you know, cause, and then every time we meet with the court, I'm like, oh, we didn't think of that or whatever the case might be. So a test pilot might be very beneficial because we can sort of work out whatever bugs Exactly. You know, that we did anticipate. Um, and then there's also, there's a con uh, consolidating resources so that if we're doing the training, we don't have to train everybody in the state just yet, but we, we're focusing and um, we're focusing on one set of trainings, the assessments that are being conducted, whatever the case may be, and, and can be able to be more attentive uh, and address whatever issues are arising. So I, I agree with that approach. Um, I think the, the last piece, if we're going to test pilot, Marlene, I guess the other thing is there's another pillar here that's coming up, at least in my mind, is evaluating it. Yeah, I was going to say, I didn't know where that kind of went, but um, but yes, I'd say evaluation and metrics or data and evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, mm -hmm. I guess we got five now. <laughs> <laughs> we got five pillars, all right. when you have a meeting you can always add more work that's right <laughs> yes. yeah okay all right well this is this is great and you know we said from the beginning that we're building building this model um we don't really have a lot to to reference at least in the united states so I'm going to add one other wrinkle to it because, you know. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> um, Why not, Marlene? The list is getting long. <laughs> so where would like promotion of this land and. Um, yeah, like where would promotion of this land? I think that, um, you know, questions about it will come through the way they come through, whether that's through the helpline or whether that's through the chat or whether that, you know, Game whether sense, that's yeah. through GameSense or whether it's through the helpline, I think that's fine. Both teams will be well-versed in this, you know, we can train them up on that, but, but in terms of promoting it um, and sending people to the right resources, working both internal to the, the licensees, but also external and out in the public, how would we, who would coordinate that? Who would pay for that? Who would develop that? Um, I think, I mean, I think ahead. there's a lot of organic sort of promotion of it. Helpline and GameSense and casino operators are all, are all like top tier, you know, promotion of this. Um, but I'm not sure. And court, the court, obviously, knowledge of, the, the availability of such a program would be included in that. But treatment providers, um, other community resources. So Marlene, if I may recommend to this committee based on that recommendation of promotion, I would add it as a second sub bullet under the development of resources, right? To add that because mm. um, don't want to lose sight of that because I think you're right. Uh, but the one thing that I'm that I'm making an assumption here, Marlene, and correct me if I'm wrong, when we talk about promotion, I think there's needs to be um not just promotion, but ensuring that there's a centralized um sort of understanding of what this is. Because obviously, once we can put like what the goal is and what it is, and maybe have a one page of what this is, it's really about could we add this on. The gaming commission website as a reference on the game sense dph so because there has to be an alignment of what this is and it has yeah. to be described somewhere it has to be some kind of written description and you know what the process is or you know who to contact whatever it's just the typical stuff that we do on our websites um so that it can sort of live in the various different other spaces that 
whether it's through the gaming commission, through the through your website or the Game Sense website, through DPH as a hub, so that if we're then talking to treatment providers or community-based organizations, they know that if they're going to either of those three websites, there's a court, there's a exactly there's a it's common coordinated in a, yeah. common language. So so the reality is it's not just promotion, it's who's going to develop the common language. Yeah. Right for that particular services. Yeah. I think that's so that's so something that we can you we, you said you were placing it under that that second pillar or area, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. I'm gonna I'm just gonna create space for that, but obviously I think it has different things that we can we can um sort of some goals in that promotional piece. Okay. So I'll I'll speak to our, our um to the our person who's handling the con uh, the project management, I'll talk to French to Francesca, who oversees our programs and services, overseeing the uh, the the consultant, and I'll give her an, I'll give them an update, and so that they can add these to the uh, to the work plan. Great. These updates. Thank you. Okay. Um, anything else on item number three? Court exclusion process support and update. Okay. Um, well, Mark, if I if I may borrow a couple more minutes, because I, I do think this committee raised a lot of concerns about this. Uh, and I want to just let people know that we have uh, taken, have really centered those concerns within our conversation. Uh, there's obviously conversations about uh, cultural and equity con uh, concerns that was raised very ex exquisitely here. Um, and that obviously is something that we're thinking about, uh, but it's also about, um, there's a, there's a concern that was raised in this committee about when we get to the implementation uh, phase, and let's say that as it goes through and they go going through the process, what happens to that individual who is identified as a gambler and what kind of resources and support that they get, right? Because currently right now in the state of Massachusetts, there's not a, uh, a um, there is not a, a, uh, sort of residential location or um, for a person to go to. So then what happens to this person if, you know, so th those, these are concerns about safety and things of that nature that I think we raised. Um, so as we're trying to implement this, we also have to be mindful that at some point we might have to revisit these conversations again to kind of, you know, to talk about them as we, as we move forward. Yes, I agree. All right. Um, utilization of AI technology for responsible gaming and problem gambling initiatives. Um, so this is a, a topic that the Gaming Commission has been working on diligently, I think for over a year now um, with some decent progress. And it came to my attention, uh, Victor, that you are also um, through DPH interested in this specific issue. Um, so I thought it would be worth just having that discussion of kind of where we are on sort of the RG side or the gaming commission side, what your thoughts are from DPH and the and, and problem gambling identification and response. And if there's any overlap or coordination but um, that exists, that would be really interesting, but at the very least, I think that it's an important topic and worth kind of sharing what what we're thinking about on this. Does that make sense? That's what that's that was my thought behind this agenda item. Um, so um, I'm happy to just kind of provide a brief overview of kind of what what efforts the Gaming Commission has put in into this and kind of what we're thinking at this point. Um, should be noted, this is a topic on the uh, commission agenda, the public meeting agenda tomorrow um, for the August 15th meeting. Um, so, um, so there is, there is a lot of attention um, in within the industry of how um, behavioral analytics and AI is being utilized in order to identify 
risky gambling behavior um, and what type of response could be employed based upon that, that behavior. And so that was sort of the basis of where the Gaming Commission started its work. Um, we, uh, back last August, when, when we were kind of kicked this issue off, there wasn't really a lot known in the United States of how this type of technology was being mobilized. We knew that there were a handful of companies um, that offered uh, risk identification technology using AI technology um, that was being used in other jurisdictions outside of the United States. Um, so we released a request for information to try to get a better sense of what the state of technology is and how it could be used in Massachusetts. Um, we received a handful of responses, including from the Mass Council on Gaming and Health, and Katie Marlene. Um, and we summarized those, those findings and put it into a report earlier, earlier this year. Um, we also, in the FY24 research agenda, we're in FY25 now, in the FY24 research agenda, we included a study um, to look at the use of, of AI technology for responsible gaming um, purposes. Um, I'm going to ask Bonnie to just provide a quick overview of what uh, the awardee of that and what the aims of that study are here in just a second. Um, we've done other types of sort of groundwork on this as well. Um, I had a really interesting meeting with um, Mark Pace, who is the president of the International Gaming Standards Association. I, I found that really, really helpful in thinking about how the gaming industry is using AI more generally, not just in terms of responsible gaming, but in terms of player acquisition and inducements um and that there is there isn't a lot there isn't a lot of regulation out there there's no regulation in the united states that really sort of defines this and puts parameters around it and so i think um tomorrow i'm going to to mention this to the to the gaming commission and see if there's anything that we should be thinking about um and then finally um the next step of the Gaming Commission, obviously, that we have the study in place. Um, we intend to meet with each of the sports wagering operators. Uh, correspondence is going out to them this week to set up meetings to get a, uh, for individual meetings with them and the AI working group within the Gaming Commission to identify how they are using it, um, using AI technology across the board, um, and uh, their interest and in collaborate in a collaborative approach of um, using this technology to, to intervene. Um, the only other, oh, there's one other piece here um, before I ask Bonnie. There's, there's um, New Jersey is the only jurisdiction in the US that currently has any type of requirement about um, using AI technology within their sports wagering to identify risky gambling behavior in New Jersey set out a sort of outline of what they're calling RG best practices that includes different levels of, of intervention. And so very interesting, um, but I also think that there's a lot more to be learned. Um, so for example, our team, my team met with Dr. Leah Nauer from Rutgers who has quite a lot of experience in this area. We hope to to use her expertise and and for the defining kind of where the gaming commission goes in this space. Um, Bonnie, could you just uh, just a very high level overview of the UNLV study that that is in the field now or preparing to be in the field? Yep, absolutely. Hi, everybody. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about um, the AI study. Um, we conducted a procurement as part of the FY24 research agenda. Um, and essentially what we're looking for this study to do is um, review the current and future possible uses of um, AI in the gaming industry. And we want them to focus on uh, marketing, player acquisition, and responsible gaming functionality and player health. 
Um, and the focus on responsible gaming will include reviewing evidence and evaluation data related to um, identifying and responding to behavioral risk, particularly on sports wagering mobile applications. Um, so very high level, that's kind of what the focus of the study is going to be. Um, and we conducted the procurement and recently awarded it to um, the University of Nevada at Las Vegas. Um, Dr. Kazra Gaharian is going to be the PI on that study. Um, and we're in the process of kind of um, negotiating the contract and getting that study into the field. So we're, we're really excited about this um, study coming up. Great. Thanks, Bonnie. Um, so obviously we're, we're churning a lot of information around within the Gaming Commission, trying to be as thoughtful as we can, leveraging the evidence that's available. Um, um, and trying to come up with sort of the regulatory uh, structure that would need to be in place in order to, to roll this out. So uh, that's where the Gaming Commission is. Um, and uh, Victor, I know you're also really interested in this space. Um, I don't know how far along, along you, you are or where DPH is. I, I'm not honestly even aware of sort of what, what options or opportunities there are how this could be used um, within that space so maybe you could address that yeah a bit. so mark i so thank you mark and and i think in general if we could take a step back i i just have sort of as a person who's been doing this work for nearly 30 years i i'm just concerned and have watched this evolution in our field whether it's gambling or addiction or mental health evolve over many years right we don't conduct research the way that we used to. I mean, we don't conduct outreach, I should say, the way we used to, right? Um, we don't um, facilitate information the way that we used to because technology has really been centered to really our society, right? And how we communicate, how we interact, how we um, you know disseminate information. And so um, when we think about our work, we have to be mindful about this, this evolving aspect of technology and how do we sort of think about um, really adapting a lot of the initiatives that we're sort of leading and adapting them to really align with, with the advancements in technology. Um, the other thing is a lot of the experiences that people are experiencing right now are is through technology, right? I mean, that's what's happening in this space. So if in my mind, I say, if, if folks experience currently right now, their gambling is through a sort of through a, through a telephone uh, or through apps, then we, we need to think about the strategies that we currently are utilizing might not be aligned to their experiences then in which they're participating in. Um, so I, I think for me is, is I'm mindful of the fact that this is a real space that's evolving. And as I, we continue to see this transformational evolvement in gambling from brick and mortar casinos to online sports betting to other forms of sort of these uh, platforms, um, we, we have to be able to think about what kind of strategies do we use or could adopt um, that really speaks to that advancement in technology. So for example, you know, one of the things that we are definitely is on our radar and we're facilitating is in regards to treatment, right? And so, you know, bringing in um, telehealth at some point into the space in regards for treatment for problem gambling, uh, because again, People are communicating through these platforms, right? Um, and, and this is the, a reality of our society. Um, and it improves accessibility. The other thing is we're thinking about, you know, the helpline. How do we think about um, utilizing or evolving the helpline to have that uh, technology um, aspect to it so that people can connect to the helpline in a way that's just not currently in the current um, form that we have it. So all of these things are for consideration, Mark, and I, I would say that if anything that you are learning or the gaming commission is learning through this research that um, we can sort of um, get access to or share some knowledge with, or I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to explore it, look at it. Maybe there's some things that come up from, from your research that might help us to kind of think more critically in areas to look in in regards to our work. But there's definitely, I mean, I, I unless the, the, our current, um, experience on gambling is different today than it was, you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, and 15 years ago, right? And so uh, we have to think about um, technology. We, we, we're doing some of that in, in, our, in our communications work, right? 
um, where there's more targeted um, sort of advertised um, communications campaigns specific to specific groups. And that's, that's all, you know, technology driven slash AI. Um, so again, I, I think for me, it's just, I just have a general, not a concern, but um, just, I, I'm, I, this is an area that I think is really important for the future of our work. Okay, agree, thank you. And my concern is the use of algorithm in AI. For example, if you live in zip code 01902, that's in Lynn. If you are Latino, that's a marker. If you are a certain age, that's another marker. So I am a bit concerned about the use of how we use, who may, we may use AI the create algorithm to identify people at risk. Mm -hmm. And also, yes, I applaud our efforts to, to, to use AI for treatment purposes, but I also think that we need a similar work to understand how the gaming industry is using AI to attract to attract uh, new new players. Right. right, there is a technology out there called digital phenotyping, and digital phenotyping is is a way of predicting social behavior based on your online behavior. So, those are the new technologies that we are facing nowadays. <clears throat> Thanks, Rudy. Those are, I completely agree with all of that. I mean, you don't go into this with your eyes closed. Um, and I think that um, part of the nature of the, the research project that we have out there, part of the reason why we're slow walking this is to try to better understand what opportunities there are, but also sort of where do we need to be incredibly cautious um, in, in moving this forward. Marlene, do you have anything to add to that? No, I think there's a lot to, to be figured out and discovered, but that's a good start to the conversation. Okay. Um, yeah, I. <laughs> um, this is probably something that we could add almost as a standing agenda item where uh, I think that we all have a, an interest in this and um, and could lend our expertise to it. So it'd be great. Okay. Mark, can I ask you just a broad question? Um, is there any data currently right now at the Gaming Commission to show the level of participation of Massachusetts residents um, in regards to gambling as it relates to both to brick and mortar versus online? You know, I. I it would be yeah. really interesting to to really just kind of get some understanding of, you know, what is the percentage of, of folks who are actually gambling mm -hmm. at a brick and mortar casino versus online? Yeah. Um, because that that was big volumes, right? If we if we say that 70% of the current gambling activities is strictly online versus at the brick and mortar casinos, that that really that means that folks' experiences and realize realize regards to gambling is through these through technology, which then even raises the importance of why mm -hmm. um, spending time to talk about our approach, whether it's a public health approach and or responsible gambling, either or, but obviously thinking centering technology in, in either of our work is important. Yeah. And, you know, keeping in mind that sports wagering just launched a year and a half ago at this point, um, we do... Uh, we do an annual online panel survey. Um, while not representative of the general population, I think that it does a good job of understanding people's gambling behaviors and, and engagement with different types of, of gambling. We So we've done it and I think we did one, an online panel in 22, 23, 24, and we have one in plan for 25. And I believe the online panel report, survey report, is it under review now, Bonnie? Could you remind me of where we are with that? Um, it's slated for presentation at the commission on August 29th. 
Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it's a very good question, Victor. I think that that to I think that would be the best and easiest way for us to try to see sort of the change shifting gambling behaviors as as sports wagering has become sort of more part of the fabric of the gambling availability in in the state. So tune in, or we'll send you the report. OK. Good. All right. We have two minutes left or more, uh, uh, but I want to move on to the next agenda item of subcommittee member updates. Um, anybody want to go first? I'll go first because I do have a new meeting, so I need to leave. Um, uh, at the council, um, we are doing a number of interesting things. Um, and, you know, you know, you just mentioned, Mark, that that we are, you know, a year and a half into sports wagering. Um, and I think we're still getting our feet wet in terms of like, what are the best ways to reach sports betting? players, um, mobile players, they are primarily, Victor, just so you know, and this is universal, but like people who engage in sports wagering, it's something like 97, 98% of them do so online. Um, so very few are going to the sports betting areas or kiosks um, that are on site at the brick and mortar. But I know your question was related to people who engage in casino gambling as well. Um, and so you know, we continue to work on how can we offer game sent services to people online. Um, and, and I think, you know, we're looking to September for our gem trying to um, implement and or test pilot some of the ways that we're thinking of that might be useful. So hopefully next time I can offer some updates on that. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think in general, um, you know, we're also preparing for, you know, Victor and I have spoken about this, but pre preparing for iLottery that has just been signed into law by the governor um, to figure out what that looks like. How do we prepare for that now? What are some of the elements that are new and different from working with the casinos and, and the um, sports betting operators? So a lot ahead of us. Um, and then obviously implementing the games, the recommendations and the game sense evaluation, implementing the Sigma updates that came through in May, um, implementing a lot of the interesting research that we have figured out or elements that we figured out from the Safer Ride Home project with this, with the city of Springfield's Department of Health and Human Services, looking at drinking and gambling and driving. Um, and then also we just concluded um, and are in the process of implementing recommendations from Dr. Michelle Malkin around LGBTQI plus um, uh, elements to not just the game sense centers, but uh, information centers, but also just overall game sense as a program, council wide things. So lots, lots going on. So that's, that's it for us. I apologize. So I do have to go. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Marlene. Yeah. Marlene. I really, I really am interested in, in updates that both of you have. Um, Victor no, and I, I have no update, Mr. Chair. I don't have any, I don't have no new no updates. Um so Mark, I um quick update. One thing that comes to mind as an update is that um we are um, going to be conducting our eighth annual uh, stakeholder listening session in October. I don't have the exact dates. I, I know Rudy may have the exact dates uh, because his, him and his team are the ones who facilitate the, um, the stakeholder listening session. And so there will be forthcoming some information that we will obviously, uh, when we publicize it in regards to registration, obviously we'll send out information to our stakeholders so that uh, folks are aware of the date and obviously ask folks to share with others. Um, this year's theme is going to be focused on youth gambling. And so just as a little background, the, the stakeholder listening session is our sort of central community engagement strategy that promotes equity and, and, and lifts up community voice. 
uh, that really informs our strategies and programs and services uh, at the department. Um, so more to come on that and we'll share the information uh, when they're scheduled. So we're gonna host two of them, um, the two different dates. And so when we uh, have that ready to go, we will obviously uh, share it with, with, our, with the Gaming Commission and others um, as well and, and invite folks from the Gaming Commission and uh, other, uh, our other partners uh, to, to, to join us. They are on Tuesday, Tuesday, October 8th, and Wednesday, October 9th, both at 5.30, and it will be online. Okay. You know, to, to that end, um, Victor, we, um, you know, we have a number of studies that are currently in the field um, to better understand, explore youth yeah. gambling behavior. Um, one that I think is, is really interesting is with Suffolk University right now, looking at the effects of advertising on their student body. Um, but we're also working with the um, city of Springfield. We're working with um, NORC. There's a, there's, a, there's a number of studies out there. Bonnie just needed to leave, but she was going to provide a quick update on that. Um, you know, certainly let's pay attention to that space. I think it's an it's an important issue for everybody here. We're all kind of tuned into that. And I think that the more we can stay coordinated on that, supporting one another, um, the better the better we are. But I agree. I think that we need to really focus on this stuff. So yeah, no, I agree. And, and whatever information um that's available at the gaming commission as you sort of produce your studies, um, as you guys uh, typically do just obviously share it with us and yeah. uh, and uh, we can reach out to Bonnie and when those studies are ready so that we can because uh, it's obviously at the top of the priority in regards to youth mm -hmm. gambling. Yeah, I mean, in one area, you know, we're working. Springfield operates its own youth health survey, um, mm -hmm. and we provide some funding to to Springfield to roll that out and. Um, in order to have sort of a more robust series of gambling related questions that we wouldn't normally have access to. So um, I would like to get you those, those questions of, of what, okay. of how we structured those questions as well. I, I don't think it's necessarily realistic for the statewide youth health survey, but I think that it could be useful as you sort of, you know, as you, we, you can do an analysis looking at those questions compared to all the other questions that are standard mm -hmm. across those two surveys. Um, okay, great. Um, we are, uh, you know, the Gaming Commission just launched our FY25 research agenda. Um, there are a number of new and interesting studies that are included in that. We have 15 studies that are currently in, in the field, <laughs> um, in addition to the, uh, the new research agenda that's rolling out. Um, under the sort of leadership of Long, um, we um, have we continue to advance um, Game Sense program, uh, Play My Way, um, and uh, communication campaign. So um, FY25 is going to be robust, um, and we're happy to um, bring on board Diana Shaw, who is a Northeastern University co-op student. Um, that is mostly kind of focused on the research side of things, but we're giving her like like the uh, the buffet of experience at the gaming commission. Um, she can try out whatever she wants. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, welcome, welcome, Dan. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, we are we are past time. I'm sorry. I I didn't want to take up too much of people's days, so I tried to limit to an hour, but obviously we have so much to discuss in this group. We will um, we will plan our next meeting. So um, with that, can I get a motion to adjourn? Uh, motion to adjourn. Okay, uh, second. 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 Okay. Um, Victor? Uh, um, aye. Aye. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Rudy? Aye. Aye. Um, and I uh, agree. So um, thanks. Sorry, I'm not used to facilitating meetings like this. You're doing a great job, Mark. <laughs>
So I have that's why we, that, that's, why we, that's why we that's why we nominated you, man. So you're doing a, you're doing a great job. I appreciate it. And the meeting uh, this meeting was very productive. And thank you for your leadership, man. It was a really good meeting. And think there's a lot of great work happening across all these spaces, and it's great. So thanks. You're doing a good job. All right. Thanks, everybody, and thank you. <laughs> all, right. all right, guys. Bye, guys. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Bye.